I'm not really sure it was a long time ago, but I think I was probably maybe eight or so, give or take a year. Sorry, don't know exactly. But it was a long time ago when I was growing up. And my family and I, we uh, went, and even then, I, we were on a farm. I grew up on a farm, so trips, you know, vacation was not a word that was ever used in, in our lives, but trips happened sparingly ever so often. And I remember taking a trip, we actually spent the night uh, to, to the Kansas City area. We had a, I had an aunt and an uncle that lived there at that time. And as part of our trip, we went to an amusement park. And by the way, if any of you have a Kansas City connection and you're as old as I am, this may, this may bring back some memories. We went to an amusement park called Fairyland, all right? This is back in the, would have been around, well, anyway, it's, it's a long time ago. I probably shouldn't go there with dates. And as part of our time at the amusement park, I rode my very first roller coaster. It was called the Wildcat. And at the time it was built, not too long before we were there, it was the world's largest. Had no idea what a roller, I mean, I knew what a roller coaster was, but I had no idea what the experience was. Um, my dad and I climbed into the car. Uh, my brother and my uncle were behind us. And it takes off and we start this long, uphill climb, slowly, creaking along, creaking along, going on forever, and we're getting higher and higher. Some of you may remember, I don't do good with heights, I knew it even then, and we're getting higher and higher and higher and higher until all of a sudden, whoosh, a big downhill, and I have to tell you, I don't know, I didn't know what G-forces were then, but when we hit the bottom, it was like I couldn't, I, I, was, I was pushed down into the seat, and from there, well, it just was more fun, I guess. Round curves and up and down and, and around speeds that, and, and I closed my eyes, I never opened them again once we hit that first down. And so to this day, if someone asks, hey, do you like roller coasters? I go, no, I'm not a fan. <laughs> and I pretty much avoid them. Roller coasters. Regardless of what your experience or what your mm, take is on roller coasters, um, I think they are a pretty apt description sometimes of life. Ups and downs, twists and turns. I think it's an apt description of faith. And I believe it is also can be a very apt description of our experience with Jesus. And so with that, I say welcome to uh, the sermon series we've been in for a while called Flawed But Faithful. It's based on the life and times of Simon Peter. We're looking at Simon's uh, connection with Jesus through scripture and also through a book written by uh, pastor and writer Adam Hamilton called Simon Peter. And Simon's relationship with Jesus is something of a roller coaster ride as well. There are ups and downs. Indeed, we're discovering that, that Simon Peter was flawed yet faithful. A flawed yet faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. And we're also coming to know that his roller coaster story of life with Jesus this is kind of our story, too. And so with that, I want to jump into our sermon scripture reading for today. It's also from the Gospel of Matthew that we heard from a little earlier, but a little farther along. We're going to be reading today from Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to read verses 13 through 26. Uh, I'm reading today out of the Common English Bible, so if you're searching on your phone to follow along, you might want to check that version out, or you can follow along on your, with your Bible or a Bible there in the front of you in the pew rack, or we'll have the words on the screen in a moment. Do what you need to do to really hear the word. And I just want to remind you, uh, yes, some of you are going, Matthew chapter 16, yes, some of this is going to be a little familiar. We've been 
kind of in the middle of this conversation between Jesus and his disciples for a few weeks now. It's a very pivotal conversation, and so I wanted us to slow down and take a good look at it. Pivotal conversation between Jesus and his inner circle of disciples. It's, it's kind of a watershed moment, and especially for Simon Peter, as we see beginning with Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Now, when Jesus came to the area of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, well, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And Jesus said, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus replied, happy or blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because no human has shown this to you. Rather, my Father who is in heaven has shown you. And I tell you that you are Peter, and I will build my church on this rock. The gates of the underworld, the gates of Hades, won't be able to stand against it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and anything you fasten on earth will be fastened in heaven. Anything you loosen on earth will be loosened in heaven. And then Jesus ordered his disciples not to tell anyone he was the Christ. I want to stop right there because, you know, Simon, in his bold answer to Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. I mean, in Jesus' response to that answer, even today, it kind of jumps off the page. I mean, Jesus seems so excited. It's like, yes, Simon, you finally got it. Blessed are you. He emphatically affirms Simon Peter at that point. And then he goes on to say, you are Peter. Gives him the nickname that we know this man better as. And on this rock. I will build my church. In other words, on your profession of faith, your conviction, your confession that I am the Messiah, the long-awaited one, the King, the Son of God, that's the foundation that my church, Christ's church, will be built on. And the gates of the underworld, the gates of hell, of Hades, will not prevail against it. You know, when Christ's church is really being the church it's called and created to be, Things that make our world not that ideal moment. Things like hopelessness and despair, oppression, addiction, sickness, poverty, sin, even death. When the, when the church is the church it is created to be, Hades, hell cannot stand up to the church's attack. And that's a big moment. What a moment for Peter and the other disciples to hear. But it doesn't last long. And so we'll finish the conversation beginning with verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he would go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and the legal experts. And then he had to be killed and raised on the third day. Then Peter took hold of Jesus and scolding him, began to correct him. God forbid, Lord, this won't happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stone that could make me stumble, for you are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. Then Jesus said to his disciples, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me will find them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? This is the word of God for the people of God. Yeah. Thanks be to God indeed. You know, what an unexpected turn of events. What a roller coaster ride. You know, what moments of spiritual high and spiritual low. All in this one conversation. 
And literally in just a matter of a few minutes, Simon both enthusiastically affirms and emphatically denies who Jesus really is. In this one conversation, we quite literally see how Simon Peter is both bold yet foolish and how he is faithful yet flawed. See, Jesus knew what was to come in Jerusalem. He knew he would die. He knew that his death on the cross, shameful and painful as it would be, would actually serve God's redemptive purposes. Jesus knew his death would draw people to God. And the very fact that you are here today is proof of that reality. But on that day, in that moment, Peter couldn't see that. That wasn't the version of Messiah that he wanted Jesus to be. And so the man who had just boldly proclaimed that Jesus was who Jesus was and who had just been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, that same man, Simon Peter, physically, did you get, did you hear that? Physically took hold of Jesus and scolded him, corrected the very one who had healed the sick and fed the multitudes, calmed the storms, walked on water, the very one who was the son of God. What? What a scene that must have been. Peter, bold, faithful, yet flawed. And Jesus' response to what Peter did, it was swift and unwavering. Get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. Ouch. Seems a little harsh, doesn't it? Well, I think maybe we need to take a step back and and try to see what's going on here. Think back to the scripture passage that we heard earlier. It was from early, it was from the Gospel of Matthew, but it was earlier in Jesus' ministry. And he's been out in the Judean wilderness for 40 days, fasting and praying. And Satan came to test him, to tempt him. And at the end of that testing and tempting, Satan offers Jesus all the success, fame, wealth, and glory a human being could ever desire without having to walk the path of pain and suffering that Jesus, even in that time, knew would would be his journey if he chose it to live into God's purposes. In other words, Satan offers the crown without the cross. And Jesus rejects that temptation. Now fast forward. Here's Peter encouraging, actually more than that, pressuring Jesus to pursue the crown without the cross. I don't really think that it was Peter's intention to try to lead Jesus astray. I think he was simply using human logic. Does that sound familiar? He was using human logic about what he thought was best for his dear friend. But Jesus sees through that. He sees through all the good intentions and wrong thinking. And he looks Peter straight in the eye. He looks him straight in the eye and says, get behind me, Satan. You see, Jesus is different. Hmm. There's a headline, right? Jesus is different. Jesus sees things differently. Jesus' driving value was not what was always safe and easy, what would make him happy. Now, Jesus' driving value was what would please God and accomplish God's purposes. And he called Peter and the other disciples to do the same, to have that same driving value. All who come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross and follow me, Jesus said. In other words, 
Anyone who's sincere about following Jesus will have to travel this path that will likely take them through suffering, just as it, as it did with Jesus. And that was Jesus' call then. And that is Jesus' call now. So I want you to let, here's what I want you to do. I want you to let Jesus be Jesus, you know. Let Jesus be Jesus. Don't, don't uh, try to put Jesus in a box to, to be that someone or something that serves my best interests or your best interests alone. Let Jesus be Jesus and follow. In other words, make Jesus' driving value of doing what pleases God and accomplishes God's purposes. Let that be. Make that. Don't let it. Make it. It, it, is, a, it is a decision of the will. Make it your driving value. Let Jesus be Jesus and follow and the point of that is, is not the pain and sacrifice just for the sake of pain and sacrifice. I mean, what was it? What was it Jesus said? He said, why would people gain the whole world but lose their life? What will people give in exchange for their lives? See, Jesus calls you to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow, because the fulfilled life that you and I long for is ultimately found only in self-denial, sacrifice, and loving and serving God and others. Some of, you, some of you know that um, a few years ago, four or five years ago now, that I donated a kidney um, to a relative by marriage. Uh, it was interesting, somewhere in this process, I, I asked and asked and finally got the medical term for who Curtis is to me. He is my bi biological nephew. In other words, Natalie's niece is married to Curtis. That might be an easier way to say it. And um, so he, he had, he, a young man, still is, had a, still has a condition that was attacking his kidneys. It had been stable for a long time, but then something happened. He got worse. And so really almost on a whim, I put my name in the hat thinking, it was just four or five years ago. Well, number one, I'm too old. And I'm not related to him really, so, you know. Well, I found out that neither one of those things really mattered. And lo and behold, I was a match, a good match. And so um, the month preceding the surgery, I went through all kinds of tests and things, and that's a whole other story. But in between all those tests and things, I had dozens of people talk to me, medical personnel nurses, doctors, social workers, and they all tell me what this is really going to be like, what the surgery is going to be like, what uh, the recovery is going to be like. You know, and they tell me that it's, especially for someone my age, that it won't be easy, you know, and that there are some possibilities for complications. Uh, and all of that, and they, it always came down to this. In the other one of those conversations, they would look at me across the table or wherever we were and say, do you really want to do this? And I say, yes. I mean, why wouldn't I want to do this? After all, in my head, I'm going, that may be what happens to other people when they do this, right? But not me. I was wrong. <laughs> the surgery went fine. The recovery was hard. There, I had a few minor complications, but they were very annoying. And it took much longer than I thought. And to be honest, much longer than I allowed it to take. And it was hard. And uh, there were times 
when I wondered if I had really made the right decision. But a couple of months after the surgery, I was talking to Curtis, and we were just chatting, and he looked at me at some point. It was at a family gathering. We were just shooting the breeze, but at one point he looked at me and he said, Steve, he said, I can't tell you how much better I feel and I am today. And it was in that moment, it was in that moment that I knew the sheer joy and fulfillment of being part of God's purpose and plan for healing in someone else's life. And in that moment, clearer than ever before, I understood Jesus' call. Now, I'm not saying that you all need to donate a kidney. I will say that even in our state alone, there are hundreds of people on a waiting list. And so if you ever consider that, please come talk to me. I'm not saying that you need to donate a kidney, but what I am saying is that you need to let Jesus be Jesus and follow whatever it is for you. Because here's the thing. We are never more fully alive than when we follow Jesus' challenge and call of giving ourselves to others. So I want you to think about that for a moment. And then we'll move on. 